onion sets, but also to plant seeds. And the question I ask alongside this, anybody who knows the answer already, keep them. but how long did it take me to grow one of these onions? I don't, I'm not particularly asking anybody. You can shout out if you want to. A year. A year? Six months. Six months. Okay, and the answer I like to give is, well, the time that I put into growing this particular onion was about 30 seconds because I planted the seed, I watered it, along with hundreds of other seeds, and then I planted it out along with hundreds of others. So at each stage of the process, I've just spent a couple of seconds planting it, planting it out, weeding it, watering it, and harvesting it. So what I'm trying to get over is, we think of, first, that onion has been in the ground for nine months. So you're roughly in the right direction from that point of view. But the amount of time I put into it, along with lots of other crops, and this was one of many, is actually just a matter of seconds. So I'm trying to put over that, in one sense, it's slow food. But this is equally fast food, because it's only taken, taken me a matter of seconds to actually achieve as a crop. So that's me, a little starting point on that. Um, and then, yeah, the second session I'm going to illustrate, thinking about soil quality. Now, if you're taking on a new patch of ground that hasn't been grown before, grown on before, uh, as long as you weed it and dig it over and disturb it, you've got a honeymoon of fertility because the soil will have built up a certain amount of fertility in the soil just from the weeds being there or from turf being there. And when you break that open, you're disturbing the soil, you're stimulating microorganisms, and for months after that, you'll get a reward, a yield of fertility without putting anything else in. And parsnips actually enjoy growing in a new soil like that. And again, these aren't the hugest parsnips, but um, I've probably eaten a lot of those, but they are absolutely gorgeous. And that's another point about the quality of organic produce, you really don't need as much of it as you would of commercially grown stuff. So personally, when I was a kid, I used to be the dustbin of the family. I'd eat all the seconds. I can remember having extra helpings of food at school, always being hungry, actually, never being quite satisfied. But since I've been able to grow my own stuff, I don't need to eat as much volume, and I feel much more satisfied by it. Uh, I'm going to contrast that with carrots, Whereas with parsnips, like I say, if you've weeded your soil and cultivated it a bit, you can get away with the crop in the first year. However, however with, with carrots, they need a much finer seed, uh, seed bed texture in the soil. And what we've got to think about is, you can see the little fine root, main root, <coughs> tap root there. That actually appeared a, a few days within a week or two of the seedling carrot germinating in the soil. And so it has to push down into the soil as far as the carrot is eventually going to swell up. And then it's got to have all the fertility around it to swell up the root. And that's a process with all the biennials that it's storing up energy from one year. That if, if we replant this, it would then go to flower the next year and make seed. And yeah, that's part of my practice to propagate things and save seed. So I've got my own seed and I find that's much better than what I buy commercially plus I've got a lot more of it. But yeah, this is soil quality that we really need to go through a process of taming the soil uh, and bringing it into cultivation, which will take at least six months, more like a couple of years, before you've got good enough soil quality to be able to grow a carrot. And one or two people have mentioned about pest diseases. In the case of carrots, they get a tiny little fly, a carrot fly, comes along, and if you haven't protected your crop and covered it, uh, the tiny little fly lands and lays one egg at the top of each young carrot plant and they grow on for a bit but when you come to dig them up you find little holes and the carrot fly digging into your carrots and that's a shame because you might have spent a lot of time preparing the soil, adding fertiliser, sowing, watering and then if you get a, a disease, a, a pest like that which can ruin your crop then you've wasted all that time and energy. And again, in terms of my motivation, if you can pick up some good tips and learn from my mistakes and others' mistakes, and therefore not go through the grief of thinking you've got a carrot crop and then finding you've got to chop all the carrot fly out and there's not much left after, that again is part of the motivation for uh, coming on this course. Uh, here's one which relates to session three, fertility. 
and hopefully some of you have come across these as a, as a class of food. They're winter squashes. They're not uh, pumpkins. Pumpkins are watery. They haven't got much nutrient content. These are very high in nutrient content. And one of the wonder vegetables when you're a home grower, because they'll only grow the plants outdoors in the summer, but the crop, the squashes themselves, if you take them off in the autumn, they'll store for up to nine months after that. So along with something like potatoes, where you harvest and store a large crop, and you've got something as a staple that you can come back to every day, uh, winter squash, absolutely wonderful. Uh, like I say, they've got some nutrients, but you can add flavour to them, mix them up, use them as a base for meals. Uh, lovely soups, uh, very nice made into chips as well. But yeah, that's something which, before I started growing myself, I wouldn't have recognised, wouldn't have been bothered trying. But now I've found that yeah, that is something that I have an, as an absolute staple. And again, because it's a fruit, inside there are seed, the seed is viable, and I can save the seed, and then I've got another year's supply from, from the one crop. I'll actually, uh, we'll, we'll cut this one up at the end uh, into however many pieces, about 20 pieces, and that's part of homework for this week, to take that home. Uh, you need to take the middle out and take the skin off, and then slice up the flesh into half centimetre slices and fry until golden brown. If you don't do that, if you just boil it up, it might not be cooked, and in that state it might be inedible, not so palatable. So that's my session three example of fertility. I call these compost fruits, because I actually plant the plants into compost heaps and manure heaps, and while the compost and manure is breaking down and settling over six months, six months, these grow into it, and I get a crop of squash, and then I've still got manure with some uh, fertility content afterwards. But they're very heavy feeders, let's say along with things like potatoes. And then, uh, thinking about the fourth session, sites and designs, that's partly about how can I protect uh, certain crops so that they'll survive and grow in our climate. And, for instance, chilies, there's three types there. Again, they've all got seeds in, so if anybody wants to try some of these chilies, take one of these, and they've got seeds in, start the seeds off now. Uh, also things like, this is... Ink and rainbow sweet corn. I've got two or three specimens which come out different and they're absolutely glorious when they're fully mature. When they're coloured like this and dry, they're really a maize. And that means uh, they're harder than a, a regular sweet corn. However, when they're young and they've just set, they're still yellow and they're still soft. So they are like a sweet corn for a couple of weeks until they start to get really mature and hard and then break off. Uh, and I'll just show you one more. This is, uh, uh, yeah, it's the same cucurbit family as the squash, uh, and also cucumbers. This is a loofah. So it grows a bit like a climbing courgette, and then the fruit, uh, the seeds come out the middle, and the fruit, the fruit, the flesh kind of rots away, and you've just got this structure left. So now I've got a loofah, so I can do my back and whatever. But all these crops, the chilies and the other crops like tomatoes, peppers, aubergines, uh, they all require a bit of protection, and that means either a greenhouse or a polytunnel. So that's in terms of developing sites, first with good soil, and then with other facilities, uh, like having lots of fruit is nice. Having structures, though, gives you protection, and that's partly so you can, in the summer, stretch the range of crops and grow more exotic things, more warm-loving things, and then I'll move on to section five in terms of crops and extending the cropping season. So this is actually, uh, yeah, I'm most proud of this, although it is a very humble achievement. What we've got here, whoop, just pouring some water out, what we've got here is a range of different salad crops. Some of them are familiar enough, that's a little bit of lettuce, but this lettuce is winter hardy, and inside a polytunnel, even though we had that terrible frost from November through December, my lettuces are still alive, and I can still pick some young leaves off there. A uh, good illustration is this, which is a small leaf of celery. That's grown up in the last couple of weeks when it's been warm enough. And celery, although we think of it as a summer crop, it will survive the winter. So it's a biennial, again, and from one year it'll grow through to the next and go to flower the next. Uh, but, yeah, 
for flavouring at this time of year, just a tiny bit of celery will flavour my soup or my stew. And then come the warmer weather, it will grow stronger and have full size stems and leaves. So I'll still get some more eating celery off it later in the spring. But yeah, I can get nine months eating from one crop of celery or celery plant by picking it repeatedly time and time again. And another one like that is uh, bulb or Florence fennel, which if you try and grow it in the summer and you get a dry period, it's going to bolt and go to flower. And you, you'll get a tiny, you won't get a bulb at all really. You'll get a flower and you can eat the flowers. But yeah, along with uh, celery and the fennel, if I can put them into a polytunnel, then I've got, like I say, nine months potential eating of fennel, and that can carry on through the winter into the next spring, same as uh, the celery. What have we got here? There's, here's one that's trying to go to flower. It's one of the oriental brassicas, a mustard family plant, and that's again in the polytunnel, and it's going to flower in middle of January. I couldn't believe it. But yeah, it forms, this one is actually meant to be a stem vegetable. So we can eat the leaves, eat the flowers, but the stem you can see is quite fat, and therefore it's got marrow inside. That'll be sweet, and that is very palatable to eat. And then going on, we've got things like mustards. Lots of different mustards. That's a basic oriental mustard. This one is called Lovely Pak Choi, and that's lighter in colour and milder in flavour. So, it, yeah. That hasn't got the bite that some of the mustards have, but then I've got ones that have got cut leaves. I've got ones that have got frilly edges and red edges. And yeah, there's almost an infinite number of different mustards. They've all got a lovely bite to them. And again, this bowl of greens, if I can just have a handful, uh, a small amount of greens every day, then that's supplementing my nutritional diet. So it's not just thinking about bulk, and volume, you know, stodge. If I can, you know, I have actually in the past had a tin of baked beans, but if I can have some salad, that's giving me the actual bit that's keeping me alive. And back into thinking about fertility, all my soil is supplemented with lots of good nutritious fertilisers, which ends up in the leaves and in the vegetables, and that is giving me the, the best quality of nutrition out of the stuff that I'm growing. There's a bit of flat leaf parsley that's still growing at this time of year. Uh, I've got other things like there's beet leaves, I've got rocket, there's corn salad, there's a bit of winter spinach still going outdoors. A lovely little heart shaped leaf called Claytonia, and that grows well through the winter into the spring. So this is just celebrating uh, the, the potential that we've got uh, yeah, to eat all the way through the year. So rather than thinking it's just a summer or just autumn cropping, and again, if I'm working with other people and they turn up to the sites that I'm working on every week throughout the year, if I can reward them with a bit of produce throughout the year, 52, well, 50 or more weeks a year, uh, that's giving real value. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Rob, but what's that worth, Rob? What's that worth? 20 quid? I don't know. It's quite a lot, yeah. But yeah, uh, greens, 25 quid a kilo mm -hmm. if you can grow them. Right. So I don't grow enough to actually kind of sell. I've got enough to redistribute some. Uh, but yeah, that is starting to have, if you were a little commercial grower, you wanted a niche market and you found a few posh restaurants or cafes or something, that is starting to be the basis of what could be a real income, that kind of thing. But my practice is I try not to sell anything, so <laughs> come back to that later. And yeah, thinking about the next one, the plant health, keeping things happy. And this is partly about... Uh, when to do stuff and what to do with different plants. Here I've got a nicely chitted potato and I can actually plant that again inside a polytunnel sometime in the next couple of weeks and if I plant it below ground the shoots will be protected by the soil from frost above ground. But in the polytunnel the frost won't be so bad as to penetrate down into the soil so the shoots will be protected and in about a month's time after planting, they push up through the ground and then they start to grow the leaf as a potato plant. And in about two and a half months, I'd have my first early potatoes. So that's potatoes. And growing potatoes at that time of year, you miss potato blight. Now we're all aware of potato blight because it caused the Irish potato famine in the 19th century. Um, and planting early, getting your potatoes off to an early start, 
is one way of minimising the danger of potato blight, which will happen when the weather gets really warm, which will be July and August, and the spores will be floating around in the atmosphere everywhere, so you won't be able to avoid it. You don't want to spray your crop with copper sulphate to try and prevent it. It probably won't work anyway. Um, so planting early and getting these chits established, I could actually put that in a, a little seedbed of soil. If I cover the shoot before I plant it out, roots will form as well. And then I'll be planting a bit later a tuber with a shoot and a root system already established. It hits the ground running and therefore it will come up just a couple of weeks after that. Watch out if you do that outside because we might get a late frost. So that's just introducing potatoes. Another relatively heavy feeder, but one point on potatoes, don't plant them into newly cultivated soil, especially if you've just had cooch grass the previous year. So if you've cleared a plot and it had grass, cooch grass especially, uh, and this is the problem that a lot of so-called experts <coughs> will yeah, tell you that potatoes are a clearing crop, that you use them to clear weeds from a, 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 a weedy patch of soil. And that works because you've got to dig to put them in, you've got to dig to get them out. So you do the digging bit. But like I say, if you've left cooch grass or had it in, in the last year, then there's wireworm that will go from the cooch grass in the soil into potatoes and you get little holes and channels. And again, it just deteriorates your crop. Uh, so. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd describe, yeah, if you want to get a nice crop of potatoes that don't have loads of slug holes in them, then you actually put them in a good patch of soil and fertilise, again, as a heavy feeder with compost or manure or copious amounts of fertility. So that's just a regular potato. That's a white uh, fleshed and red skinned potato. Here I've got a different type, and I think this is a Shetland black, actually. There's another one called Salad Blue. Uh, these are great because you can Im e immediately do potato prints with them. Oh, nice. Uh, if you're working with kids or something. They're quite a strong purple. And, yeah, that gives you the opportunity to grow... Uh, then you can have red, white and blue potatoes. Not that I'm any kind of nationalist or anything, mm -hmm. but just for fun and diversity. And, yeah, these come from uh, Shetland, where they'd be well away from the potato blight. And also... If you buy seed tubers of potatoes, uh, and my mates at Beanies have got a good stock in at the moment, they're grown in Scotland because it doesn't get this potato blight. So that you're guaranteed to get a, a healthy crop. Um, I'm still talking about pest and disease, though, and I'm going to show you this. If you were from South America, where potatoes come from, you'd also be familiar with this. And I've heard that they grow as much of this as they do as potatoes, in places like Peru. And this one is called oca. It's a different family from the potato. It has a different growth habit. It's like starchy, so it does taste like a bit, bit like potato, but it's got a lovely lemony tint, tinge to it. So you can boil or bake, same as potatoes. Uh, skin's a bit chewy, but fine. And that is oca, which is related to a plant we have growing wild in this country, which is oxalis. Uh, you can eat the leaves as a salad, they taste lemony. And this plant, its habit is, it forms these little tubers as a response to cold weather at the end of the year. So as it dies down and we get a light frost, uh, it puts its energy into forming tubers which will then store through till next year. Uh, but of course the point is that these are not uh, the same family, they're not Solanaceae family like potatoes, therefore you haven't got the problem of blight. You've got a different problem, which is if you get a really hard frost, your plants might get killed down before they form a root. But I've grown these for several years around here, and they grow fine. So that's an alternative. Rather than persisting with the crop that we know and we love, uh, but does have its problem with potato blight, uh, again, we've got the option as home growers of just swapping over onto a completely different crop or growing both at the same time. And if one gets damaged, we've got lots of the other one to keep us through. And that is another underlying message to everything I'm presenting, that diversity pays off. Because if one, yeah, you might plant several different varieties of potatoes, some are more prone to blight and other diseases, and some are more blight resistant. But if you grow a range, then you've got a much better chance of, again, uh, guaranteeing that you get a good crop of uh, 
what you need, your staples and your basic nutrition. Um, I'm going to show you this, and this is where I confess to being a user of this particular substance. It's tobacco. Ah, anybody want to try a bit of the smell of tobacco? Let's pass it out there. Absolutely gorgeous. And as a plant, as a crop, that starts off as absolutely minute seeds. And they are frost uh, tender. They won't start outdoors. So they have to be started off under protection as tiny little seedlings and then potted on maybe once or even twice before you end up planting them outside. And once they get outside in the summer and there's no frost, they'll romp away and each leaf will be about a foot long. When they go to flower, the plants are about five, six foot high. That's Virginian tobacco. But yeah, that's just illustrating that we might have to go through lots of different processes and be aware of how to sow, how to manage an indoor warm growing space in the early spring, and also have enough space to raise lots of seedlings. And that's a classic, when you get a packet of seed and you sow all the seeds into your pot or into your tray, and then a month later you've got 500 or you know, 1,000 or too many, uh, you've got to spend the time potting them on. When they're in pots, you've got to put them, in, in this case, in the warm still to look after them. So it's trying to think, every, everything that you sow or plant, have you thought what the next stage is going to be all the way through to cropping it? Have you got enough soil ready in time for the number that you're, you're raising and you're, you're planting out? And that is also a mention to, yeah, to not sow too many things. If you've got mates and you can give them away, if you've got capacity, that's fine. But just watch out in terms of getting a bit carried away with sowing loads of stuff and then not quite having enough time, place and space to put it. Um, the eighth session we're going to do is going to be about propagation. And that's various ways to multiply plants, to make more plants out of few. Over here I've got a nicely established cutting, uh, and this one is a, a joster berry. A joster berry is a mixture, a cross between blackcurrant and gooseberry. Blackcurrant's quite small. Gooseberries, they've got them pips in them, so they're not quite so nice. This has got the best of both worlds. It tastes like a blackcurrant, and it's a bit larger, so it's good value for money. It's a very vigorous plant. It's been hybridised by the two being crossed together. So this will grow into a small tree, about this tall. And regularly crop, and the fruits will stay on the plant for longer than the other plants. What I've done here is I've taken a stick, a bit like one of these shoots up here, pulled it off with a heel, with a bit of the old wood on there, and just stuck it in the ground, and left it. And over the course of the year, it's uh, healed over where it's been damaged, and I've got a really vigorous, strong root system, and I've made a new plant. And that would be worth maybe three or five quid from a garden... Well, actually, probably more from a garden centre. Prices of plants is ridiculous. But, yeah, with all the soft fruits, which includes things like raspberries, loganberries, I can raise my own stock. So this is an explanation of your pink sheet, which you've got with your intro pack. And... I'm not offering you six plants each, but if you make six choices that you, you accept or like, I'll guarantee to supply about three for everybody. But they come without soil, bare-rooted, and spring is coming along. So the, the timing of this is, if you can ask, request them in the next couple of weeks, and I'll bring them along in about three weeks, or four weeks, uh, the recommendation is you need to plant them out in about, within about a month for them to be settled and ready to grow on in the spring. I do put some of these in pots as well, but bringing a load of pots on is more than I'm prepared to do. Uh, but yeah, if anybody has got a suitable patch of ground that they can prepare in the next couple, few weeks and you want to start off some soft fruits, uh, then I can supply you with a few of those. So that's part of the deal of coming on the course. Uh, black currants are great, there's different gooseberries, loganberries, all that kind of thing. Uh, if you've started a bit of a collection already, look at one of the weirder ones and uh, choose that. There's one on there called Worcesterberry, which is also a cross between a gooseberry and a black currant, and that has really vicious spines on it, and it's one of the plants which has been used as a kind of barbed wire plant, 
if you plant it at the edge of your property, it's so spiky that people don't go through it. So that's just illustrating this process of propagation, in this case making cuttings. Would anybody like to take a gooseberry plant, uh, a jostaberry plant home today? It's looking for a home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you're just there, Charlotte. Right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> That's not the only thing I'm uh, doling out this evening. So, yeah, matching that, partly by raising from seed in some cases, but also by that process of taking cuttings, I maintain and propagate about 100 different herbs, perennial herbs. And this is on your orange sheet, and in this case you can make about up to ten choices, and I'll try and supply you with about five things each, depending on what's available. Uh, but I'm going to dole some of these out tonight, if, if you'd like to uh, be interested in them, call out. Uh, here's one, it's not just thyme, this is orange thyme, and that's a really lovely plant. Any, anybody? Yeah, can you pass that through? Yeah. Orange thyme. Uh, do this fairly quickly. Rue, which you can do, use the leaves as a spice and a cake flavouring. Mm. However, the grey leaves, if you get them on your skin, they can cause photosensitivity. So the sap of this, combined with sunlight, is a bit irritating to some people. Mm. Uh, but it's a lovely plant, and uh, herb de grass, one of the grey leaf plants. Anybody interested in a rue plant? You don't have to take them all, but pass them over there. Root. I think they've all got labels. And here's a very low creeping thyme, a Corsican thyme. This one grows nicely in pots or in uh, uh, edges of paths. So that's a very small leaved thyme. Anybody want to add? Yeah, Robbie. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And here's a lovely one lawn chamomile. Uh, anybody after lawn camp? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Do you know already? <laughs> Just rub and smell the leaves. With all these herbs, I recommend you use your olfactory memory. Rather than trying to keep them in your conscious front brain, if you smell them as I pass them out, then that will register deep within your brain, and you're more likely to remember the names. But that lawn camomile is a lovely smell. Here's another one. <laughs> Have you just popped in off the street? I've just popped in off the street. Uh, well, we're up to something. <laughs> Sit in the corner if you're going to stop in here. Otherwise, you're not welcome. Ooh. Uh, yeah, here's one which you won't be able to buy, uh, or it's harder to get hold of. It's Penny Royal. And those of us who remember Royal Icing will love this smell. Anybody? Interested in it? Royal icing. Yeah, he's going for that. <laughs> and rub and smell the leaves. The reason that it's not uh, available, widely available, is if you have too much of it, it causes your internal muscles to contract, mm -hmm. and it has been used as an abortificant, an abortion-producing plant in the past. <laughs> so if you go into a herbalist, you can't buy it on its own. You might be able to buy it in a mixture with other things, but that's quite hard to get hold of. A couple more. Here's a French tarragon. Ah, yeah. So this is the one that's hard to get hold of because you can't grow it for seed. You have to obtain the actual rootstock to be able to propagate it. And that's died down in the, in the autumn, but the shoots of it are already starting up, uh, not been in protection. So that's guaranteed to survive. French tarragon. Uh, let's just do a couple more. Fever few. Anybody got migraine or headaches ever? Yep. <laughs> so you, just, uh, you can rub the leaf, smell it, that'll help. If you rub it on your temples, that'll be good. Or you could actually eat some or have teas for it. But yeah, that tea for you, it's the, the answer's in the name. The, the, in the name. Um, one or two more. Anybody want to try angelica to grow your own angelica? It grows into a large plant though. That's the Zoe back there. And a couple more, a couple more just culinary plants. A little rosemary plant there that will grow into a nice plant this year. Anybody? Mar Marks. Mm -hmm. And a different form of thyme. This one is creeping thyme. If you plant this at an, the edge of a bed, it'll crawl over the edge, and yeah, uh, bunch up creeping thyme. Here we go. Thank you. And just have a rub and a smell again. Uh, a couple more. Well, we're down to. I've got one which is a fruit. 
This one is what I'm calling haute bois, that's French folk in the woods, strawberry. And this strawberry is completely unlike the ones you get in the shops. The ones you get in the shops, they've bred them so that they'll sit on the shelf for up to a month and still look good, but they do taste like cardboard. They're no good to eat. So this one is rather the opposite. It ripens one day, and then it's over and blown just a day or two later. But if you can get them on the right day, they are the absolute if, you know, best, best strawberries you've taste you've ever had. Anybody want to try that? It's strawberry plant. Go back there, mate. Cheers. What was the name of Strawberry variety. which means high wood. H-A-U-T-B-O-I-S. And then a couple more. This is Dane's violet as a garden plant, but we can also eat the leaves. It's German rocket. It's stronger than our regular rocket, but that has a lovely flower. You can eat the flowers. You can eat the leaves. Uh, so you've got multiple value. And that's my response when people say, uh, why aren't you a gardener? Why don't you grow flowers? All these plants flower. All these edible plants can be eaten. Anybody want to try Dane's Violet? Good, that's okay. And a couple more which are just more flowery. This one I was actually given uh, a plant at a raffle last week, last year. It's a, really a primrose or primula. Uh, it's just about to go into flower, so it's going to be early flowering. Uh, I don't think you can eat that. You can, you can use cowslips as a medicinal plant. Anybody else try just for the flower, a bit of primrose? Bobby again. And a nice biennial, which will carry on for more, more than that, Sweet Williams. Again, it's just a flower. Sweet Williams. And these are lovely as little bunches of flowers to give away to people. And the last one of all, box. Well, that's really a tree, and it could grow into a larger plant. Uh, I've propagated again little cuttings, but that is what you classically get, say, if you know the, the gardens at Versailles, and they've got miles of box hedging that the guys have to clip, and it takes them all the way to clip a box. Very nice. So that was just a little bit of a giveaway. That's the ethic of the course. But accessing these little plants, like when El saw, El or Ellie? Ellie. Ellie saw the French tarragon, you knew that that was the hard one to get, didn't you? No. No? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, that is. I've just been putting in my cooking. So you've, you've been using it, yeah. Um, so I thought I'd made an amount of money and I'd like to grow that. Catch up with that. And okay. yeah, that is a point about collecting these little herbs. You start off with just, just a few, half a dozen, and then once you've got them, you realise, oh, you can branch out and get some more. And in terms of value for space, these perennial herbs that you can eat every day of the year, potentially, uh, like the rosemary and the thyme, give you greatest value. So if your starting point is a windowsill or a balcony, these are the ones to go for. Um, uh, I'm just going to do one more little bit on the end here, which is just to show you. I've still got one or two apples left from the autumn. There's a cooker and there's an eater. These are starting to lose condition a bit now. This cooker is, you can see it's shiny, it's waxy, and it's got this smell of ethylene coming off it. That means it's ripe and ready to eat. These, a uh, bit past it, they were great at Christmas, they've gone a bit over, that's an eater. Um, along with loads of different types of nut. In here there are cob nuts, Spanish cob nuts. Some of these are actually purple hazelnuts that have little red nuts in, like a, a, a peanut. And once I've stored, you know, taken one crop of that one year, if I store these for more than a year, they improve year on year. So this is uh, one thing we can try at break time. Ed's going to chop up some apple so we can have a nibble of some apple. And, yeah, if you're prepared, mind the nutcrackers, don't crack, catch your fingers. But you're welcome to try and open up a few hazelnuts. <laughs> Thank you. And, yeah, they're one or two years old, and I think they get better in flavour. They're not huge, necessarily. They might have shriveled and shrunk a tiny bit, but the flavour gets intensified. And alongside that, here's the next year, well, this year's first crop, which is the hazelnut setting. We've got catkins, that's the red hazel with different coloured catkins. And if you do look carefully on these, you can just see little red females. And apparently nature's quite like this, that the male is all flamboyant and flashy, 
and the female is actually quite small, like, it's like, well, I'm, no, shut up. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it's these tiny little red pistils. The, oh, no. These are actually flowers. That's where the nuts are going to form from now on, later into the year. But it's happening, again, right in the middle of January, end of January, when very little else is happening. But that's a promise that I'm going to get another hazelnut crop this year. So I'm looking forward to that. And the last thing on this is, going on to the last session, we're thinking about harvesting and saving seed. So who's bought some seed packets already for this year? How, how, much, how much have you spent? Or how much is a packet of seeds worth? How much do you pay for a packet of seed? A couple of quid, isn't it? Yeah. And how many? How many? How many did you get? You might get a, a couple of dozen peas, yeah. if that. So there's a couple of dozen. Oh, but I've got a bag here, and it's got about a thousand no, peas in it. No, Sorry, love. We're going to have to. I'm asking for silence. No, because yeah. you, you've had your time. All right. See if you see if you pop off, though. Okay. No, 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 that's closed. Thanks, love. See ya. Bye. Bye. All right, love. Now, yeah, these peas are different from what we think of as English garden peas. The big, fat summer peas that we really love and are full of sugar. Um, they don't grow through the winter. So if you buy your seed packet and your peas are all shriveled up, they've shrunk, those are only good for sowing after the frost. So start them off in March or April and they'll grow in the summer, fine. But these ones, smooth seeded, they'll grow all the way through the winter and they'll survive the frost. And normal practice, I sow them in the start of November. This year, we got the frost straight away. So they were just germinating in the soil when the snow came. But then after the snow went away, they, they germinated under the snow. Absolutely amazing. But this is another trick, so that rather than having to wait until the spring to sow the crop, I've already sown them in November, and that, that is already out of the way. And that's another general recommendation. Thinking of the year, everything peaks in terms of activity in April when it's warming up. And suddenly we've got to get the soil ready, and we've got to sow, and we've got to do a hundred more things. So the more that you can do before that, and add after that, and spread your workload over the course of the whole year, rather than get too frantic and get overwhelmed in the, in the busy part of the year, the better. So these peas are one type. Do you want to ask? I was going to ask you, how do you know, well, you know when you're buying them, you can't see what's in the packet. So how do you know you're buying the smooth ones? Or are There's we not going to some, buy them? Some, some commercial ones like Meteor and Pilot, which you might be able to get hold of. But yeah, yeah, the seed company should be aware of this, and they should sell you winter hardy peas. I've got some which are actually uh, more like a, a wild vetch. Uh, I don't think I've got them here. But yeah, there are some that, w yeah, that, that are, are brown seeds rather than cultivated ones. Um, and they will grow, yeah, likewise, all the way through the winter. Um, so yeah, that's telling us that some of the things that have been highly bred and cultivated by you know, technicians and scientists, to make them good in one sense, well, they've lost the quality that they had originally when they were wild. So the wild ones would survive the winter, but the cultivated, highly tinkered with ones have lost that ability. They might taste nicer in some ways, but they're less reliable. So again, it's partly about diversity. And I've brought a few, uh, these are peas and pea beans and some broad beans. And yeah, I've got some, this wide variety, Progretta. That's a marrow fat pea, that's like your summer pea. And I think I've put summer pea on there. And then I've got other ones. Uh, let's have a look. Karubi de Musain. That's a sugar snap, which is four or five inches long, an inch wide. And if you can eat them in the pod before the peas swell up, they're absolutely gorgeous. You stir fry them up. That's a wonderful one. And there are some winter hardy ones in here, including purple podded, which has purple flowers, which is gorgeous. That's winter hardy. And also a yellow sugar snap pea. That's a gorgeous one. What else have we got here? And ones which will survive the winter with different colours. Some of these come from different places. 
This one I'm holding here, if you imagine that was larger when it was uh, cropping, this is actually a cow pea. And there's another category of crops, that some crops were bred to feed cattle. So it comes out huge, and it has good nutritious value for cattle feed, but actually they're perfectly acceptable for humans to eat as well. Uh, especially if you can get them when they're at that sugar snap stage, when they're young, early. So I brought this evening uh, a box of peas, broad beans, and like I say, pea beans, which aren't a cross between the two, they're a different type, uh, grow small beans, basically. But you're welcome to pick out a couple of packets from this box and take them home. And any that are marked with winter hardy, you can start them off now. So you can take a packet home. Uh, same applies to the broad beans. I've got red continental here and a couple other varieties. You can start these off today, tomorrow, now. Outside? Yep, outside even. And they'll take a couple of weeks at least, a bit longer if it's cold. But that's something to get on and start with now. So that is, again, part of the ethic of the course and you've bought into this. You get some freebies as we, as we, go, as we go along. All right. Um, what, what happens when the, there is no frost? It doesn't matter. That's okay. It's protected under the soil and it's able to still grow after the frost. Yeah. Let's just have a think. I think we're ready for a break, but our tea person's outside. outside. Eh? <laughs> Do you want to fill those pots up, Ed? And we'll stop for a break in just a sec. So. Yeah, I'll just do a little conclusion to this then. Um, yeah, thinking of the term organic, a lot of people think of that as take away the chemicals, but not supplementing with good organic practice. And so one of the crucial things to say is we want to be organic by addition, by making sure that we're always supplying sufficient nutrients and the right conditions for the plant to thrive. And plants do have this ability, uh, given de half-decent conditions, to thrive, to, you know, in fact, you know, throw off pests and diseases sometimes, if you're given really good conditions. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of pests where the advice is actually, uh, if you've grown your plant well enough, you just wait for the predator to come along and eat the pest. So you don't always have to intervene and fiddle and try and stop something or have a war on the pests. Sometimes just improving your practice, making sure the plant's okay, and it's got its own self-defence mechanism. So trying to tap into that as much as possible. I've mentioned, yeah, in relation to biodynamics, uh, one of the, key, the two key concepts to that, let's think, it's the word dynamic and making your soil dynamic. So again feeding your soil sufficiently so that there's lots of microorganisms. Ed, can you peel them? Okay. Uh, and the other key concept with biodynamics is thinking about an enclosed system. So if you had a farm, that's quite achievable because you've got some animals and you've got some wildlife and you've got some weeds and some woodland. You can actually have sufficient fertility being recycled within a large space to actually think of it as enclosed and not have to bring in fertility or export your fertility in the form of crops too much so you keep a long-term balance of fertility. And again, it's harder on a small scale and the smaller scale you're working on, the more justified you are in bringing in materials to make sure you've got the fertility. But one concept of biodynamics is, yeah, to think if you closed up and never brought anything more into your garden gate or into your, into your farm, how what fertility would keep going? How much produce could you produce without exploiting the rest of the world's ex ex resources and importing loads of extra fertility? Um, that, that, that's, that's not forbidden. You are allowed to bring in fertility in various forms, but it's just keeping that in mind, that what could you produce without exploiting the rest of the world? And I'll just make one point about permaculture, which is uh, yeah, to interpret that in terms of persistence and not just growing for one year, but all you're growing should have in mind that you'd like to be carrying on doing it indefinitely, year after year. Now, we're all going to die at some point, so there's a limit to that again. But just trying to think, have that as a kind of undertaking that you want to do well to your soil, 
do wealthier plants. And of course, by planting perennials, uh, that's going to give you the longest uh, investment and the best return. So where I've planted orchards and fruit trees, uh, it's a bit frustrating for a couple of years because you don't get much back. But then five or ten years down the line, uh, yeah, I've got one allotment which produces several hundred pounds of fruit each year, and I do less than one day's work to get it. So that's the potential payoff. And this is thinking about this subject in the way that you would any other investment. If you're buying a house or you know, buying something, you'd research first, you'd find out, and then you'd invest in something that's going to give you a return. If you invest in a bit of soil improvement, you get some salads going. In three months' time, you're happy because you've got some salad. But if you plant a load of fruit trees, and then you wait long enough, then you're really going to experience the kind of abundance <coughs> that we're all looking for. And just to conclude today, to conclude this first half of the session, that's an explanation of why I've, word, I've used this word, ediculture. I've been growing for 20 years, and some people call me a farmer. And some cultures, an allotment is almost as big as most people's farms. Seriously, in Asia, some people have just got half an acre, and they subsist off that. They grow enough food, and they sell some to stay alive. Uh, other people have called me a gardener, and I feel rather insulted, because <laughs> I don't want to be associated with flowers and ornamentals and chemicals. Um, so I've had this con con conundrum that I'm not a gardener, I'm not a farmer, what am I? And then last year or the year before, I thought of this word, eddy culture. And it just means edible culture, that means growing food, food growing. And that is my suggestion, that what we need at this point, again, in our bigger development, social development, is we need a chance to have a new go at food growing. Agriculture, who knows a farmer? You know, there are, there are not, not many around, there aren't many successful ones around. And like I say, gardeners, lovely flowers, but if you can't eat it, I'm not interested. And people get very possessive about their gardens and all that kind of thing. So what I'm suggesting with that word is if we have a new word, then that gives us a chance to do it in a new way. And that's the proposal. And now I use ediculture to refer to any edible growing space or any element of people trying to grow their own food. So that's my starting uh, pitch. Uh, if we have a break for, well, like 10 or 15 minutes so you can get to know each other and mingle and mix a bit. We've also got seeds. Grab a few seeds if somebody wants to try a few uh, uh, of the hazelnuts there. We'll pass the greens round. And then just over here I've got a system for distributing books. little sheet, if you can sign them out, bring them back in a week or two. There are some very good books here. Um, Books on plants. There's somebody was interested, if anybody's interested in biodynamics, this book, Wolf Stoll, that's one of the best of all. Got some good books on fruit, permaculture manuals. They look huge. I'm not expecting you to read them all, but just have a look through, get an idea about what's involved. If you get really into it, there's still time to kind of read them all. And my request is yeah, rather than take these away for three or four weeks, if you can just tr try and bring them back in a week or two then they can be lent out to somebody else. And what I've brought here is the kind of best, best selection of books I've got. I have got more, so if, they, if, if you borrow lots of these, you can have two or three or more if you want. Uh, and I'll bring along even more to supplement that. So that's break time, and we have our tea persons at the back, and bits of apple to try and stuff.